Okay, so what we're going to move on to now are the grouping principles. So we're still going to talk about bottom-up processing, so moving from the component pieces to the bigger perceptions, how do sensations pieces add to our perception. Uh, and this is really gestalt psychology. So gestaltism being uh, the, the word for form or shape. And their argument was that um, the the parts of sensation built into the bigger whole. So the, sh the, the way that things were um, made our perceptions. Okay. <clears throat> so we're going to talk about figure and ground first. So figure and ground was a way to think about um, what people were focusing on in a picture. So how did we know what the interpretation was? So in this picture, which is the famous faces and vases, um, diagram. The black part is the faces <clears throat> and that would be the figure if you were focusing on face and the white part would be the ground. So the way I think about figure and ground is a figure is the foreground, the part of interest, what you're paying attention to, and then ground is the background, the rest of the information. So if I switched and said that this picture was a vase, I could tell that my figure, my focus, was on the white part. It's not necessarily all about color though. So in this particular picture, we uh, have a person's face, which will be the figure, or if you turn your head to the side, you can see that it's the word liar. Um, and so the figure continuously stays the white part of the picture. It's just our perception changes based on what we're focusing on. All right, so I'm gonna give you a second to figure out what this picture is given the figure ground rules that we just talked about. <clears throat> and most people have trouble with it because it's a severely degraded picture. So let me show you another one. <clears throat> and hopefully now you can see the cow. So here's its ears, here's its head, here's another ear, its face, eyes. I'm terrible at drawing. Okay, so it's a cow. Same picture back up here. Uh, here's the cow's face. Oops. Here's the cow's face. <clears throat> uh, and then here's the cow's body. Um, so most people don't want to focus on the white part being the figure because generally, especially in black-white photos, the black part is the focus of interest. So that's what makes these things so hard sometimes is because we're going to focus on the black part um, because of our traditional interpretation of pictures. <clears throat> okay, so let's go past these cows here. All right, now we're going to move on to how Gestalt's thought we grouped things. So given this environment and all of these stimuli um, and these sensations, how do we make sense of our world? So perceptions based on the way that things were grouped together. <clears throat> so there's four. Uh, proximity, which is things that are close together or grouped together. Good continuation, which is just called continuity in your book. Things that are on a continuous path are grouped together. <clears throat> closure, things that are closed will group together, and similarity, this one's pretty easy, the way things look causes us to group them together. Um, and similarity is very similar to the idea of stereotyping. So there's a picture of a proximity. Um, if you ask people what these things are, over here in one, two, three, this is a square of dots. This one is a rectangle of dots, and this one is another rectangle of dots. So people group these three things together um, <clears throat> separately because, yes, they're all dots, but the way that they're sort of squished together makes me feel like the first one is a group of a rectangle of dots. And that's sort of how our perception of um, old TVs worked. So the grouping of these dark colored dots in that particular order made it look like an eye versus what would be the rest of the pixels on the screen. Okay, so for proximity, things that are close together get grouped together. <clears throat> if you're on a Windows machine, you can click the little buttons and make this do something. <laughs> Unfortunately, I can't because I'm on my Mac. Um, but the idea is that um, <clears throat> good con cont continuation, continu continuity, <laughs> good continuation or continuity here is that these 
this line is considered one thing and then the separate squares oh goodness um okay i just got cranky with us there for a second um then these squares here are considered another thing um, if you can click modify on the picture, it will separate them at that, that squiggly line and people don't tend to think about it that way. For those of you Mac people, I've got a different example. It's a good continu continu continuation, I want to say con continuity here. Um, we see this as one giant X, so the two lines are continuing in their fashion, versus you don't see it this way as one check mark and another check mark. So continuity is this idea that things that are continuing um, along are going to keep going that way. Uh, so cars that are moving in one direction will be considered one group. Cars that are moving in another direction is a separate group. <clears throat> Closure is this idea that things that are closed get grouped together. So if you ask people what number one um, the, is depicting, they say rounded rectangles. If you ask them what number two depicts, they say apple cores. And literally the only thing that's been moved are these lines here at the top um, have been moved over to the middle. So it is the same sensation but different per perceptions because we have changed what's closed. The other way this works is that often we'll see particularly very familiar objects as closed even when they're not. So my terrible star here, because, even though it's not closed, I still see it as a star. <clears throat> so things that are closed get grouped together. Similarity is probably the easiest one. Um, things that look the same get grouped together. So all of these girls in the front, they're wearing the same outfit, they're probably doing the same dance movements, they're going to get grouped together. All of these, what we assume are men in the back, are going to get grouped together because they're wearing the same outfit and they look the same. Okay, so this is also how stereotyping can occur. <clears throat> Alright, now on to depth processing. So depth processing, the idea is that we don't see in 3D. I know you think you do, but that is the perception of the world around you. The sensation is all flat, so everything on the retina is flat. Um, everything is tagged in the parietal lobe with specific um, spatial cues, but it's still all 2D. So how do we perceive 3D? Well, first thing we're going to do is the visual cliff study, which is the famous uh, study that was looking at is depth perception innate or learned. Then binocular cues, so two eyeball cues and monocular cues, uh, one eye at a time. So good news, you don't need both eyes to see in depth. Visual cliff first. So the visual cliff studies were um, a bunch of uh, studies on if ch young children, babies would cross the visual cliff. So the visual cliff is the spot here where it goes into depth. So the way this is set up is that um, there's a giant table with a tablecloth on it that is um, sent down on the edge and if I can see in depth I can tell that there's a drop off that's the cliff part if I can't see in depth it will look like it just continues because I can't see the down part but I can see that the tablecloth continues um, there's a giant piece of glass on the top because um, the ethics committee isn't too fond of letting babies just fall off of tables uh, and mom is standing down here on this side asking the child to come to her in the original studies over here, <clears throat> uh, the babies would not cross the visual cliff, so they claimed that depth perception was innate. In the newer studies over here <clears throat> on the left side, um, the babies would cross the visual cliff. What's the difference? The difference is how long you've let the child uh, or the child has been crawling before you test them. So originally they tested children who had been crawling six or more months because they wanted children that could actually crawl. Um, and it turns out that if you test children who've been crawling for like three months or less, they will cross the visual cliff versus children who've been crawling for six months or more. And so the idea, the, the, the newer studies really showed that the visual cliff is not innate. The depth perception is not innate. It's something that you learn by moving around in your environment. 
Um, so children bumping into tables, thankfully for me, is not necessarily a bad thing because it helps you understand that vertical and her, uh, horizontal depth cues. Okay, so depth perception is not innate. <clears throat> All right, two types of cues here for two eyeball cues. <clears throat> First one is retinal disparity. Um, and the second one is motion parallax. So some pictures here for retinal disparity. <clears throat> uh, if When you were a kid, you had those little red um, view masters that you put on your face with the circle um, picture uh, wheels that you put in there and flip through. Um, <clears throat> what those are called are stereograms, and so we would have the visual for the left eye here, whoa, and the visual for the right eye. Uh, so you're getting a picture, one for each eye, because what's happening, remember, is that each eye is sending that visual information, it's coded by the, um, by the occipital lobe and sent back to the parietal lobe for the wear system. And so what you're looking for is the difference in the eyes. So hence the term retinal disparity, difference between the retinas. So especially let's look at this guy here in the back. So there's a difference here that helps us understand that he is further back in the picture than the two guys in the front because of the distance between, uh, the d disparity between the two eyes pictures. So all those little cues about um, the difference between the two pictures helps us understand things are further away or closer to us. So motion parallax is the one where you're riding in your car and the uh, telephone poles are flying by. So things that are close to you when moving move appear to move faster than things that are further away. So the mountains here in this picture don't really move because they're way far away from us and we're not really making that much time on them versus the trees here in the front are closer to us because they're moving much faster. Um, <clears throat> and so motion parallax is the idea that things that are close move quick, things that are far away move fast. All right here, so a bunch of monocular cues and I have a lot of pictures for these in order. So linear perspective um, is especially used in paintings to make things look in depth. Occlusion, texture gradient, aerial perspective, and light and dark. So let's do linear perspective first. So when you're looking at this picture, your brain doesn't go, oh no, the road is going away, no more road, down here at the end, it stops, end of the line. Um, what your brain interprets is that it's just getting further away. So linear perspective is the idea that parallel lines converge at a distance. So parallel lines come together, which indicate further away. And we're gonna use this depth cue in the illusion section to talk about how you can trick people. <clears throat> so here's another example of linear perspective and a little bit of trickery. Um, this is a really long hallway. So here's the linear perspective part. Um, it's not a Willy Wonka hallway where things get smaller at the end. So uh, the parallel lines are coming together. And so if you ask people who is bigger, the woman in the front, the woman in the back, they say, oh, they're probably the same size because the woman in the back is just further away. But if you Photoshop the pictures and put the woman in the back next to the woman in the front, uh, you can see that, like, just sensation-wise, she is much smaller on your retina than the woman in the front. But because of the linear perspective here, we expect her to just be um, further away and not a small person. <clears throat> All right, so first things first, this is kind of fun. This is me. Um, this is one of the uh, largest mud volleyball tournaments. <laughs> it's held in New Mexico as a children's hospital support. Uh, so this is me and a bunch of graduate students. And so um, occlusion was the example for this slide. So you know that I am closer to you than the net here because I am in front of it. And my friend back here is closer to you than our friends up here because he's in front of him. So occlusion is the idea that things that cover up other things are closer to you because they're hiding the things behind you. 
So people who are covering up other people um, uh, <clears throat> are closer to you than the ones that are being covered up. Uh, and as a fun aside, you have to duct tape your shoes to your feet or you lose them. <clears throat> Alright, texture gradient is that your brain does not interpret that suddenly there's 8 million more lines out here. It's that the lines are getting further away. So as things get further away, they get more textured. And let me give you a better picture here. This is on the beach in San Diego. And it's not suddenly like, oh my gosh, look at all of these muscles, so many muscles, muscles overtaking the world. It's that they're probably the same distance apart that they are here, sort of interspersed, but because they're further away, it gets denser. That looks like there's more of them. <clears throat> all right, New York here. So um, I am standing on the Brooklyn Bridge taking this picture, so I'm kind of very far away. So to give you an example of how far away I am, that's a helicopter. Um, so aerial perspective is the fact that things that are far away, like the Statue of Liberty here, are fuzzier. Okay, ignore the fact that this is actually smog, um, but it's kind of like the clouds on the mountains look fuzzy because they're very far from you. So things that are further away are sort of more um, out of focus because they're so far away. And so this is clearly the closest thing to me because it's the most in focus. <clears throat> Last one, light and dark. This is in La Jolla, San Diego. And so this the light area here around the edge of the um, walkway is the closest thing to me because it is lit up. So the light um, hitting the closest thing to you helps you figure out what's closest. The dark area back here is further away because it's dark and the light can't reflect as much. So all those taken together are ways that our um, each eye interprets depth. We don't need both, we just need one of them. <clears throat> all right, so last slide for this section, <clears throat> pretty sure. Um, we see things in color, that's your cods, uh, cods, <laughs> rods and cones. We see um, different feature detectors for shape. That's the edge and bar detectors from the last section. We have specific detectors for motion. So everything we see gets broken down to all these little pieces. So how does that all get put together into the world that we, we think of that we don't even comprehend how complex our vision is to put together even the words on this slide? And that whole thing is called the binding problem. So how do we take each little receptor's uh, responses to the, to the visual field out in, um, out in the world, remember receptive field on the inside, and put all those together? And really, most people call this recognition. So how do we recognize objects? How do we know this is an apple? Um, and that is going to be the topic for the next section on the theories for recognition.